Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Um, welcome everybody. We're thrilled to have you all here. We were kind of almost overwhelmed by the um, level of interest. So it's a rather large group here, which is why we chose to do uh, the webinar format. Um, but we will try to have some interactive sec uh, sections at least. Um, and, uh, but bear in mind that there's 170 plus people here. So um, it's, you know, we, we won't have, uh, not everybody will get a chance to talk. Um, however, um, as a heads up, um, everybody um, should definitely make uh, use of the Q&A feature. So this is a special part of the um, uh, Zoom webinar setup. If you haven't been in a Zoom webinar before, in your little toolbar, it may be hiding under more or three dots. Um, you can find Q&A. And if you click on that, you can submit questions. Um, the way we will handle it here today, differently from the conference moving forward, but for the workshop, is that uh, since there's two of us presenting, um, Jeremy there and I, um, will take turns. Whoever is not speaking will try to answer questions live in writing in the Q&A window. Everybody should be able to see that Q&A window. So even if you just want to monitor what's going on there, um, you can keep an eye um, on that. Um, there should also be a possibility, there's a little like thumbs up button where you can upvote questions. So as things get crazy and we have lots of questions, if many come in, um, if there's other people asking questions you also want an answer to, just click the like button and then we'll sort of automatically get a priority order of uh, which questions are most pressing and what most people are interested in. Um, the chat in Zoom, the regular chat, is also available. Um, feel free to alert us to any issues if something is not working out in terms of how the webinar is showing and all these sorts of things. Um, but otherwise, again, for interactive uh, things and especially questions, use the Q&A, because um, there we can directly put the answer with a question in the chat. Things get lost, especially in large meetings. Um, so that's what we're um, going to use. Um, I'll give a very brief, quick intro. We're already six minutes in, so um, we have a lot on our plate and don't want to lose um, too much time. Um, so I want to start. Usually one does this at the end, I guess, but I'm going to do it at the beginning um, to make sure everybody's here and everybody sees us. I want to start with some acknowledgments. Um, this whole project and the whole platform has been made available with the support of many institutions and people. Um, so especially um, from Penn, uh, there's been crucial support from the University Research Foundation, the um, ILST initiative, um, and in particular MindCore, um, uh, that has really made the new farm possible. Um, a number of people I want to give a quick shout out to, um, obviously Jeremy, who will be taking over from me um, before too long, um, who's here. He's really the brains behind all of this. Um, so um, as you will see all the technical questions, he will answer and he may uh, have to correct my uh, demonstrations of some things if I screw something up. Um, so he's, he's the one that's devised this all and really has made it all possible. Um, I want to give a special thanks to um, Angelica Pan, who has um, voluntarily helped a lot with um, developing our documentation for the new farm, um, made this uh, that look all nice and touched up um, and, and really uh, enhanced the documentation. That's been a great contribution. Uh, we're really grateful for our efforts. We have also had a, a research assistant at Penn, Amila Mukic, who's helped us a lot. Uh, there's a bunch of other people um, using uh, the PCIBEX Slack, which I'll say more briefly uh, about, and uh, they've been very helpful. And um, there's Alex Drummond, um, whose name many of you may know if you've used the original IBEX farm. Um, we certainly, I think, offer a lot more than that version, but without it, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So we do stand on the shoulders in a sense. Um, on a related note, let me just sort of um, uh, point out that um, this is a community effort and we want it to be more of a community effort um, uh, even than it is now. And so we uh, invite you all to get involved to contribute to and support PC IBEX. Um, collaboration can range anywhere from request a template. You're starting to want to make an experiment and don't know how to do it. Um, there's a, 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 a um, link here and I will share a link to these Google slides later um, and you can request a, slim, a, a template. Um, and uh, you can, of course, also get involved more hands-on with actually uh, enhancing the functionalities. Um, like I said, we have a Slack group um, that you're free to uh, ask to join. Just email us at support at pcibix.net. Um, and uh, the other support bit that I want to um, mention here um, is that in its current instance, the PCIBIX farm, as we call it, it's supported by MindCore at Penn. Um, the sort of cognitive science hub um, at Penn. Um, it costs money to host these things. And the way that we're set up now 
um, MindCore is uh, generous in supporting us, but if we can uh, get some support from the community in terms of donations to support these efforts for the long term, um, that will also be great. You can find more on that um, on the documentation website. Um, the PC IBEX form really packages two functions. Um, so one, it offers a simple coding interface for implementing experiment designs online, and it allows you to host and share experiments for both data collection and for open science code and resource sharing. Um, and so these two things come together, um, but to give you a little bit of history, um, the hosting and the platform, uh, the, the coding platform environment are really uh, somewhat different. Um, and to understand the history, the original IBEX farm by Alex Drummond has been around quite some time, over a decade, I think. Um, and our initial step was to add, uh, create an add-on library pen controller that would allow you to do more things there. That was our first big step um, over the first few years. Um, then some time ago, about a year and a half or so maybe, um, we started the first PC IBEX farm. Um, with um, hosting of our own. And just recently we've released this new farm that you'll be seeing and using today. Um, on the hosting side, um, just to clarify things, um, our new farm, I think as you'll see, offers lots of convenience and many new features, um, but you can use the pen controller environment on any farm instance, including the original IBEX farm. Um, and you can even uh, fire up your own instance, either locally or on servers that you own. More advanced stuff, of course, that you may not jump into, but good to know. Um, for users that have used a prior farm, we want to point out that migrating, we've tried to make it extremely easy. So while things do not get transferred automatically, um, you can basically just create a zip file and um, drag it into a new project on the new farm, and you can uh, transfer any projects that you have. Um, on the sort of essential feature side, PC IBEX can accommodate um, lots of experimental paradigms. Um, so it includes standard psycholinguistic tasks like self-paced reading and acceptability tasks and so on, things that already were available on the original IBEX farm. All that, of course, is still present. Um, but uh, what PC IBEX allows you is to have a, a more versatile control uh, to allow for dynamic trial structure allow for a greater variety of input options. Um, all of this is possible with quite precise timing measurements. Um, and in one thing that in particular that PC IBEX makes possible is to incorporate more easily sort of multimedia stimuli, auditory and visual stimuli, um, all with detailed control over um, and logging of timing. Um, and all the timing that, by the way, is done on the uh, user end. So internet speed is not really an issue there, meaning the timing is relatively accurate. Um, and as you'll see, there's a very flexible control over the visual layout, which is not that easy to establish, but we'll see how that works in just a bit. Um, some exciting new features of the new farm, for those of you familiar with previous ones, um, obviously the PC IREX code base is built in, um, and it offers one simple uh, design interface um, and also a much easier sort of user interface altogether. Project and resource management is much more streamlined than in previous versions. Um, and a really exciting feature that I'll say more about um, in just a moment uh, is that uh, it makes it much easier to share projects and code with a simple click. Um, so that's all exciting. Um, and then there's also the more advanced functionalities that many of you we know are very interested in. And we'll come to that in the second part of today's um, webinar. About the sharing functionality, um, the new farm when you have a project and you'll use this if you're following along or you'll see it in the tutorial later on if you do it then, there's two types of links when you have a project. Um, one is sort of a demonstration and or cloning link um, and the other one is for data collection. So this also allows you to keep your results files neatly separate. Um, the demonstration link uh, basically, well, it does what, it, what the name says. It leads you to sort of, this is what my experiment looks like. Come try it out without being a participant contributing to the results. And when you see that, um, by default, you will also, while seeing that, see the sort of clone link at the very bottom of the slide here, um, the brown bar that's at the top of the web page when you open the demonstration link. And by clicking there, you can literally just create a copy of the experiment, see all the underlying code, um, and have access to all of the uh, resources. So we think that greatly facilitates um, collaboration for one and also open science practices. It's also what you can now use um, for troubleshooting and support. So when you call for help on the, um, either by email or on the forum, you can just share the demonstration link and then um, say, Jeremy, who will likely be answering, you can access all the underlying code and see uh, what's going on. 
Um, but in terms of the open science practices, we really think um, this opens up the exciting possibility that as part of your methods section, you can just share that link. People can take your experiment and they can access all the underlying code and resources. Um, so in principle, they can basically get a replication version of the experiment up and running uh, literally in one or two clicks and uh, making that whole process much easier. So we're very excited about um, this functionality. The advanced functionalities, um, which all of you are excited about because we created this little word cloud from based on your registration input. Um, so uh, we have audio and video recording capacity built in through a media recorder. So this can be done on a trial by trial basis, uh, again, with detailed control over timing. Um, and then there's um, also mouse tracking and basic webcam based um, eye tracking using the WebGazer API. So the eye tracker itself is not our making, um, but we've integrated it here and uh, streamlined it. These things do require some additional setup. So we will reserve the final part of the webinar today to talk about what's required in sort of general terms and, and answer general questions about that. Um, but of course, these are um, exciting new developments um, that I know many of you are here for. Um, and especially in times like these, where it's hard to do in lab work, um, having these things available through an online platform is especially valuable and exciting. So we'll, we'll make sure to have some time for this um, at the end of today. Um, but uh, given that the vast majority of those that um, registered um, are really uh, more at the sort of introductory level end and don't have a, a whole lot of uh, experience, I think we had on a scale from zero to five, the mean was just over one, what people self-indicated. Um, so there are also people that are more advanced. Those of you can just hang back and uh, wait for the later parts to get the exciting updates on the more advanced things. Um, but we want to make sure to make this accessible um, to everyone. And the whole idea of this platform really is to provide a, an accessible um, coding interface for experiments. So while under the hood, so to speak, it's all JavaScript based, um, we really try to set things up so that you don't need any prior programming knowledge um, and still give you explicit and transparent control over sequences um, of events. Um, that ultimately we think requires a code interface that if you have sort of a visual, um, what you see is what you get interface. It gets really hard to make that happen. Whereas in the code, it's very transparent and explicit. So you do have to learn this new mini language basically, but we try to keep it pretty basic and simple and transparent. That said, um, we are starting to make more templates available, um, even though templates are kind of uh, go counter to that idea that you should design things on your own, but we realize that they are a valuable tool for getting started um, and modifying um, existing sort of setups. And so they're definitely um, valuable. Um, but again, the core idea, which we think is actually pretty essential to good um, experimenting is that you really think very carefully about every minute aspect of your trial, what happens when, how things unfold, what the timing is, what appears where, um, and the PC IVEX mini language indeed is designed um, to give you control over all those things um, in, an, in an easily accessible way. Um, so we will start out by working through the um, some parts of the documentation and the tutorial. Um, there's sort of a basic and an advanced version here. Um, and we're going to skip some parts and skip around a little bit, not work through everything. You can, of course, access all of this um, yourself at doc.pcibix.net and clicking on the relevant items in the menu. Um, and uh, so that will be about an hour or so, and we'll try to have some room for Q&A throughout. Again, for those of you that have just joined, please use the Q&A button for um, submitting questions at any time. We will try to answer those live um, uh, in writing, um, and we can also tie it into presentation where possible. Um, and then we'll try to have some live Q&A parts as well where we, where we can unmute people that, that want to ask questions live. Um, Note, just to be sure everybody knows what they're getting into the Q&As, both the questions and the answers will be visible to all. So in that sense, it's more like a standard Zoom chat. Won't be like that for the CUNY conference, but for our workshop, that seemed like the right setting. And uh, again, uh, if we have lots of questions coming in, it may be useful if you make use of the upvote function so that we see which questions uh, lots and lots of people have an interest in. So you may wanna open the Q&A and just uh, uh, take a look at what's coming in there. Um, in order to um, sort of follow what questions come up and which questions you may also have. Okay, so um, we can go to the documentation. So just to give you a quick uh, uh, orientation here, doc.pcibix.net, which also serves essentially as the new homepage, has all this 
um, material here. There's different parts, and this is sort of, um, uh, uh, this is what I referred to earlier, Angelica Penn's uh, helpful doing of reworking the tutorials and making things available. There's sort of a conceptually based um, introduction to all of this, um, and people have different learning styles, so these are different ways of making things uh, accessible. The core concepts, it's a great way to start if you like sort of getting the big picture um, first. Um, I'll just give you a, a very quick glance at what we're looking at um, when we're going to be coding here. Um, we basically define trials, so the sorts of things that you see um, highlighted here um, that get introduced, opened up, and then we create elements and then we do things with them. That's sort of the overall general structure um, that you'll be um, seeing. Uh, on the level of the entire experiment, there's a lot more to say. We'll see this sort of unfold. Um, what we're going to uh, jump to um, for now is more sort of a hands-on uh, build as you go along and, and grow your understanding uh, type of approach. And that's what the tutorials um, are for. Um, and so we're going to start out with the basic tutorial here um, and then uh, move along. Um, we've said it in the emails. Hopefully, um, everybody saw this. Um, we would like to ask people not to actually create accounts while we're doing this um, on the PCIVX farm. You can do all of the tutorial work without being signed in. This is another exciting new feature of the farm that you can access stuff um, even without having an account. Um, that's also great for sharing things. Um, but so we just want to avoid overload on the farm with account creation processes. Um, so uh, this is um, basically where we're going to uh, get started. And um, let me see, I may have to make sure I share in the right way because I didn't share my sound before. Um, okay. There we go. Just realized my sharing settings were off from what I started out with. So, um, so here's the simple experiment we'll start with. Um, we'll code this whole thing. Um, so you get this little welcome page and then you click to the start. The fish swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. And then you press F or J and that was it. That's the whole experiment. So this is the uh, thing that we're gonna build in the first um, basic part. Um, the um, first steps to get started here um, are the following. And again, everybody is welcome to follow along actually doing these things, working with the um, tutorial. Um, you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, demonstration and code sharing link in action in section 1.2 here, um, where you see the basic tutorial starter experiment. So if you click on that link, you'll open a new tab, and now you see the coding interface um, on the new um, farm environment. Um, everything is on one page. You have the sort of resource section on the left and you see there's a bunch of files there. Um, and those files are files that we'll use to have the audio and the images for the experiment we're building. Um, there's also um, the main script window, which is the one that we're looking at. And this is where um, you're going to be coding things. As you see, it's empty. That's because we're just starting and we're gonna go through things from the um, uh, following the tutorial. Um, and there's other important links here. You have a little preview window um, in the bottom uh, section here, but you can also, as you code the experiment, click on the open a new tab um, link, and then uh, a new tab will open and you will try the experiment. So we're not quite ready for that yet, um, but this is the environment um, that you'll see. Um, you'll notice I'm not logged into the uh, farm right now either. All of this works just fine. There's a little warning message here. We can ignore that for the time being. Um, but uh, we'll be able to build our experiment just fine without being logged in. So we'll get started with some uh, very basic um, trial structure. Um, what we want to build, I think I'm gonna, apologies, we're gonna be skipping around a little bit in the interest of time. Um, so this is kind of what you'll uh, see when you see the experiment There's a debug window we'll get to when we actually um, take a look um, at these individual things, but we're gonna jump ahead to section 1.3 and create a new trial. And you'll see there's these little instruction boxes in the tutorial, um, and uh, we will add bits of code uh, one by one. Whenever you see these sort of plus signs, that means we're gonna add these things um, to the um, code that we're building. So uh, we'll, we'll create a first trial. I'm gonna switch between windows here. Um, uh, commenting out is done with uh, two forward slashes. So any of these bits that are grayed out here are just um, notes to ourselves, they're not part of the program, uh, uh, the actual um, experiment programming. Um, and then we're creating a trial. 
we're give, creating a trial and we're naming it. We're giving it a label in the um, uh, brackets here. And this trial doesn't amount to much. In fact, it doesn't amount to anything, but it is the uh, uh, first step and beginning here of what we're doing. Um, a second thing, so you see this, we, we try to keep the code light, but here you see the pen control on new trial bit. Um, that's one thing that we're um, improving upon um, by putting a shortcut at the top, um, namely this additional code here to say that um, you should uh, basically, uh, we're telling the firm to put the pen controller prefix in front of all of our commands by default. Um, so we're going to add that at the top here. And once we've done that, um, with this prefix here, we can now get rid of the uh, additional pen controller prefix and it reads now much more easily, just new trial, very transparently, that's how you create a trial um, by adding new trial. Um, so that's the very basics, nothing is in that trial yet. So we want to turn to elements and then um, add some commands that we can execute on those. Um, so elements, right, this is sort of like our ontology, the types of things we create to um, have uh, something happened with in the um, experiment. Uh, there's 21 different types altogether. We're going to focus on a few key things like text, image, um, key presses, uh, button, and audio. And to create an element, all that you have to do is um, create um, uh, within the trial, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whatever element type you want prefixed by new. So new audio will create a new audio trial. And the, there's some strange feedback from somewhere. Okay, not for me. Um, and then there's a new text and new image. All of these um, will add elements to the trial structure. Um, you note that within each of these, there's two things in parentheses. Um, and the first thing that you'll see when you create a new element is always going to be a label, a name that you assign for purposes of working with um, that element. It's not strictly necessary in all cases, but it's a uh, good practice to give a name to your trials, um, at, sorry, to your elements. Um, and the second element, it will depend on what type of element you, you have. The second argument here, in the case of an audio file here, it's going to be um, the uh, file that we're referencing, which is part of the resources um, on the farm. In the take, case of a text, um, it's just going to be actually a sentence, right? So we can add all of these things um, to our structure here. And the way we do that um, is by um, adding these things um, within the new trial. So you now see the parentheses over all here and closing the new trial. And that trial now has um, uh, three um, elements in it. Uh, the important thing about labeling, um, which we'll make use of later, um, is that uh, once you label uh, an element and create it, um, you can come back to it later and do more stuff on it, right? So this is the illustration here of um, uh, referring back to an element. Uh, you can create an audio element, then you might do other things and create other elements and do something with them. And later on, you might wanna you know, play the audio again or do something else. And for that, um, you have these get commands for all the element types, you just prefix get. And of course there, in order to get the right one, you're gonna to have to refer to the label that you introduced when you created the um, element. Um, so we're getting closer to having actually um, something uh, to work with here in terms of uh, creating uh, an interesting experiment, um, but the creation of the elements uh, itself doesn't really do anything yet. Um, we have to execute some commands in order to actually do something. Um, there's a number of different commands. We're gonna um, just uh, use a couple simple ones um, that are executed on elements. Um, and so the way that you actually call a command um, is by just following the um, element that you created uh, or that you got if you use the get command. Um, and then uh, you can do something with it with an audio, for example, um, you can play the audio. Um, with the text, you can print it and the same with um, an image. It's just putting things on the screen um, bit by bit. So we're going to add um, all of these things to our trial. And it's important again to note that um, without doing that, I'm just going to use copy and paste here for the, uh, in the interest of time. Um, if we didn't execute these commands, creating the elements won't do anything as far as the experience um, uh, from the user that takes the experiment. Um, you have to execute a command for it to play or print 
uh, etc. Um, so again, this is sort of uh, uh, allows for transparency in terms of what happens. Um, and it's useful because sometimes you want to create an element at one point and not do anything until later. So that's why you're going to have to have these uh, commands that uh, only invoke something at a at explicitly at precisely the point in time that you want to um, get something done. Um, so if we uh, try this out now, let's see, is this the right point to try this out? Um, right, we can we can give it a try. Um, so this is, um, the code is perfectly fine. We can open it in the new tab, um, but something surprising will happen. Namely that all you see is that, oh, the results successfully, successfully sent to server, where was my experiment? Um, well, this sort of um, illustrates another um, important aspect of how all of this is executed, um, right? The, the script is always read from top to bottom um, by the farm as it executes it, and it doesn't stop on its own. It just rushes through things. So even though we didn't see anything right then, um, it actually will have presented the text and the image and, and everything, um, but it immediately uh, proceeded to finishing the trial because it didn't have anything uh, to do otherwise. So in order to actually slow things down and um, pull the brakes, we're gonna have to pause the experiment. And typically that will involve the user interacting in some way um, or placing some other constraints in terms of what actually um, happens before you proceed and continue in executing the script. So one very simple thing and uh, that will, will work exactly for the task that we're after here is that we want to um, play the audio, display the text and the image, and then we're waiting for a key press because people are supposed to make a choice ultimately, right? So um, we're not quite there yet with all the images, but if we add a key press element um, at the end of this trial sequence, new key, key press, and then specify which um, buttons to press, um, you can leave this blank and then any button will um, work. Um, then now at this point, um, the, there's the opportunity for an input. In order for the experiment to actually pause, you again have to explicitly tell um, the execution here that you want to wait. So the wait command is going to be crucial for pausing things. That means if there were other things to come, and the only other thing to come at the moment is the end of the experiment and sending the results, um, right? those will now not proceed until this wait condition here is satisfied basically. So if we uh, try the experiment again, the fish swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. We now have all of this displayed and nothing happens until I press one of those keys and then the experiment is over. So now we have sort of more control over the um, time flow here. Um, okay, so there's lots of options. And I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all the possibilities. You can um, work through these um, options here on your own once you start thinking about it. And this again highlights the fact that, well, you really want to think carefully about what happens when in as your, as your trials unfold, right? What happens if somebody presses the key before the audio is done playing back? Do you want to, you know, call it quits and end the trial? Do you still want to play back the audio, um, et cetera? There's lots of different options in which you could um, implement that. Um, so, uh, we're going to, uh, the, the experiment here is going to go with one option on that. Um, but uh, I think I'm just gonna skip a couple of details here again, because you can read up on these things and we wanna make sure we leave enough time for everything else. If you follow along here um, bit by bit, this is one option that I guess I'll go with now for just illustration um, is to uh, add a get audio command at the end of my experiment here and uh, then have a wait command on that. And that will ensure that um, the audio will get to finish playing um, afterwards. Again, there's more to be said here. The documentation says uh, a lot more in detail about the various uh, options um, in particular, about well, that change we maybe would want to make um, that uh, you have different options here uh, to allow for different possible sequences of events. And if we want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, no matter when they press the key, this get audio uh, will be executed successfully. We use a special notion of wait first here um, that feel free to ask about it. But again, in the interest of time, I think I'll just um, leave it at that. This will sort of um, give us the uh, behavior that we want here. So the I fish can... swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. So I actually clicked the button while it was playing and still the audio continued playing. And when it got to the get audio here, it basically checks, um, right? 
to see whether the audio has been played back or not. Um, and uh, with the wait first, we're going to get the desired behavior here. Okay, so I'm going to add a couple more details and then um, we're soon probably going to wrap up already the basic section and then Jeremy will take over for the advanced one. Um, the layout, of course, um, is somewhat wanting at this point. We have not yet shown you much control over um, how to arrange things. And here are a number of things we can do um, to um, uh, make it more attractive and also add, add some additional functionality. So one thing we can do, for example, is that we can position the text that we're creating um, in the center. And that's simply the center command. Um, and then we have the special unfold function here that you may want to use for some things um, if you um, want sort of dynamic unfolding of things. Um, and uh, we're going to add that before the print command here. Um, and this will now sort of format the text in terms of where it appears and the unfold command does the unfolding that you saw in the original version um, of the experiment. So center and formatting commands like this um, uh, are very useful in terms of control over what appears where. Um, notice also this general pattern here. I didn't, oops, apologies. I was trying to highlight this. Um, the uh, general pattern, the commands all start with a period. And they all have parentheses, even if there are no, there's no even if there's no content in the parentheses. So that's something that's important to note. Um, another important comment on this bit here is that um, the centering has to happen before you print it, because again, everything gets executed in sequence. And if you print it and then center it, um, that's not going to do the right trick at the time the print uh, is happening. Um, this wouldn't uh, unfold in the right way. Um, some other sort of aesthetic bits, um, the image, we want to, may want to define the size of the image and that on an image um, element is simply the um, size uh, command, which uh, allows you to uh, say by default here without any indication that uh, the pixel size, so 200 by 200 pixels. Um, and then um, you can also, um, of course, add the second image if you recall the experiment as we had it. Um, for illustration at the beginning um, had two, image in, two images in it and um, that's what we're seeing here um, now. So now this is going to be a bit more elaborate and the images are sized. If you want to check it out, you can try a the fish experiment. swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. So things are better in that the images fit on the screen, but you may not want them on top of each other. It's much more natural to have them next to each other. Um, but just like um, pen controller sequentially runs through the code, um, it also um, prints everything that it does basically on a new line. So in order to get away from that linear structure, we're going to need um, one more um, complication or one more tool, I should rather say, something that really enhances the way you can present this, things on the screen. And this is um, what we call a canvas element. And it's just what the name says. Uh, you define some area on the screen and that is now your canvas that you can paint on and position things on um, as precisely um, as you want. So the canvas element um, is introduced in the code down here that you create a new canvas, um, you name it, give it a label, and then you have um, some uh, pixel uh, uh, numbers to specify um, the size of the canvas. And then within that place, uh, within that space, you can add things with the simple add command. And here, of course, we again want to refer back to the images that were already previously introduced. Um, so that gets us um, very close to what we want. Um, the, uh, so I'm just going to, again, make things somewhat quick. I'm just copy and paste the whole thing. We're just making a few small additions here. Um, note that um, at this point, we don't want to um, print the individual images. Um, and that's already uh, showing here before we had printed them right away. But now um, this is a case where you create elements and only later, later, namely when you create this canvas, do you actually um, get back to them and get image and you add them to the canvas. And then at the end of having the canvas all created, um, you're going to print the entire canvas, which will of course include all the things that were added to it. So if I didn't get anything uh, mixed up anywhere, then you'll see, ah, see, I did get something mixed up. Of course, this would happen. Um, 
now people can spot the error. I see. So I think I failed to include the closing parenthesis at the end. And that was. The fish was. swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. So you see now sort of this um, uh, area in the middle right under the sentence here where you have the uh, two images. This is the canvas, right? So the uh, canvas area and the um, images are positioned um, precisely in the way specified in the coordinates um, here. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. You can add text to the canvas. You can you know, add things further down below first and then later on add things higher up. You kind of escape that otherwise um, necessarily linear structure of just adding things on the screen one by one. Within the canvas, you can place anything anytime wherever you want and add things later on. So that gives you sort of great um, freedom. Um, there's a little bit here that I'm also going to skip. Um, obviously, oftentimes you want instructions to add to an experiment. Um, they function in just the same way. You see that um, here you're going to create a new trial um, and then just a bunch of text that gives you the instructions. Um, you can do that on your own and we'll come back to it later. Um, but I think right now um, you can just sort of see the result. Um, notice that in the text elements here, you can reference um, HTML. Um, code so you can indicate paragraph breaks, um, for example, you can bold face things and so that way you can make things a little bit nicer like in the top version here. If you don't use any formatting, the text is not um, that exciting. Flopping. Um, another um, quick note here, um, you can uh, when say you know you have a long uh, bunch of text elements that you're adding and you want to have the same effect for all of them. Um, you can set defaults for particular element types and you can reference that by creating an element or it's the same syntax basically as creating an element at the beginning of a trial and say the default for text elements within this trial should be the following, center them all and go ahead and print them all. And then you don't have to invoke those commands and specifications for each individual element. It will apply to everything um, within that trial. So that's um, also quite useful. So we're almost there to have something that's uh, at least in a mini version, something like an experiment, um, but we're not logging any data yet. So just like with anything else, you really have to generally um, tell pen controller um, here um, exactly what you want it to do. And logging of information um, also um, falls under that general approach. Um, so the two places that we're logging here um, in the, um, trial structure that we've created is that we would like to know um, right when that canvas was printed. That is when the images were put on the screen and the adding the log command here will automatically capture um, the timing of these things when this was displayed. Um, and then of course, when we seek input from our experimental participants, we wanna know what they did and usually when they did it. And the log command here on the new key element um, does the same trick, it will now log um, both whether the F or the J key was pressed, crucial indication of which picture they chose, um, and the timing um, of that as well. So with all of that, um, you can run these things. I'm going to um, just give you a preview of the results, although I can also show you where to see the results. Um, so under, uh, under results right here, if you click that, a new window will open and you'll see something very basic um, of the sort. Um, of course, you can download those in, in different ways. Um, but uh, for the moment, right, there is a lot of information, but the general structure is essentially that each line represents something that happened, right? Including when was the um, audio playback started? Um, when did the sentence get printed? Um, when did the uh, canvas get printed on the screen? When did the key press occur and what pr uh, uh, key was pressed? So the last two lines here in particular at towards the end um, encode all of this. So here I see uh, the F key was pressed um, and this is the time. Uh, the time is in a uniform uh, uh, format. Um, that's It's a Unix time stand, uh, stamp. But for now, we'll look at this in a bit more detail later on. Um, the basic idea to see is just that well, having timestamps for every event, right? When the image was displayed or the canvas was displayed and when the key was pressed, that basically gives you one angle at the, uh, or one perspective on a response time. And you can calculate that very simply by just taking the two time spans and doing a subtraction between them. So these original times are of course um, uh, uh, very large numbers, but once you subtract them, you see here the response was in 
Uh, this is in milliseconds, so 1,713 milliseconds. There's more systematic ways you want to do that um, when we have lots and lots of data, but this is the basic logic behind it all. Um, and that's, that's where we go. If you are logged in, uh, we won't do that right now, but you will also have um, a publish button um, that you can uh, toggle here. It won't work now while I'm not logged in, but in order to start collecting data, you need to uh, click the publish button and then under share, um, you will get different options. Again, like I showed in the slides, the demonstration link and the data collection link. Um, so that's, um, and this one here isn't populated yet because I haven't published it, um, but um, that's the idea. And that's the link you would share to actually um, collect some data. So that's the very basics. Um, I realize some things might have gotten uh, uh, slightly, uh, uh, gone over slightly quickly, but we wanna make sure to both go over the basics and also leave time for more advanced things later on. Um, so I think um, I'm gonna wrap it up with the basic tutorial here um, to review, right? We just created a simple experiment. Um, we had some audio playback, some images, we arranged those, we formatted things somewhat um, and uh, we showed you how to lock the basic experimental data. This is all just still one simple trial um, and obviously things should get more complex and that's exactly what we turn to in the advanced tutorial. Um, if there's any pressing questions at this point um, of a general sort about this bit, um, we're happy to answer those. Um, and otherwise I think I'll just hand it over to Jeremy and I'm gonna stop sharing right away. And beware, so I see there's some comments, uh, questions coming in. I'll try to attend to them, uh, but what, just while uh, Jeremy gets ready to uh, screen share. Uh, to, so we will cover a lot more um, about having participants in different experimental groups, um, having a whole batch um, of uh, trials, having counterbalancing. Um, we'll, we'll get a glimpse at all of that um, in the advanced tutorial. All right, so Jeremy should take over um, with that part. There we go. Sorry, it took me a while to unmute myself. Uh, well, thank you, Chloe, and thank you everyone for uh, coming here. So, um, Okay, you're seeing my screen. So what I will do is um, right now here, the page you're seeing is the basic tutorial page, the very first step. I'm just gonna uh, reopen the, the link to create a new, um, a new experiment here. And I'll switch to advanced tutorial, right. And I'll just go, um, well, first let's take a look at what we're trying to replicate here. Okay. All right, so now you see that there's an additional consent form at the very beginning. This is just a mock consent form. Now, a, a feature that might be uh, uh, useful for some of you is, you know, you can type in your ID. That's something that's, you know, practically speaking, it's, uh, you often want to collect uh, IDs from participants. The sheep roams in a pen, which is strikingly red. And now you notice the fish that swims in a tank, which is perfectly square. The experiment moves to the next trial the even before walking. it can do anything. The deer run in a wood, which is extremely sparse. And that there are multiple trials. And then when it reaches the, the last trial, the, you know, there are four trials, then it goes to the next, uh, sorry, to it sends the results. And then you have a final screen here. So uh, basically, yes, this, um, this uh, advanced tutorial will show how to have more than one trial um, and um, cover a few other things like randomization and these kind of things. So let's uh, go to the next page here. All right, so the very first thing that we'll see is uh, this notion of a template. So the idea is that we will want, as you saw, you know, we have four experimental trials that all have the exact same format um, and so one option would be, you know, we already saw how to create one trial. We could simply copy and paste the very same code that we used for that one trial four times and then just modify the bits that we want to change from one trial to the other. But there is a more, um, um, uh, more optimized way of doing it, which is simply to use what we call a template. Uh, so basically reusing the same code and just, you know, um, marking the bits that will vary from one trial to another and, and fill those 
parts by looking up a table that will list different items, different trials that we want to, to use. So here on this page, we see uh, a, a table or what you could call two tables. And actually, uh, when you create an experiment using the link, and you know this one here that, that we created using the link and the resources, there is a, a file here, items.csv, that contains the table that we will be using. All right, so I'm gonna close it now, going back here. And so this is what we'll use to uh, generate more than one trial. And the idea is, uh, and you'll notice one thing about that table is that there is a group column. And so the idea is that here in this group column, there are two different possible values, A and B. And what will happen is that pen controller will detect uh, that column and will automatically subset the rows to um, the ones that contain one of the two values. So for some participants, they will see trials generated from the A rows only, and other participants will see the trials generated from the B rows only. So this is how, you know, it's a very, general here idea of how you would create group designs in pen controller there are you know uh, details about how to handle these kind of things uh, i will i will not spend too much time on it right now what is important here is that as soon as you have a csv table in your resources folder then you can use this template here you know this is the general idea here the general syntax of how it works and as you can see this bit here you already are familiar with it that that's what we did in the basic tutorial you all you need to do is embed this part here inside a template environment which is just using this command here referring to the table the csv file here and here you'll have a keyword <clears throat> that you will be able to use to point to uh, your table and to columns from your table and, and actually use the values from those columns inside your new trial um, environment. Okay, so here is uh, the code that the, um, sorry, that the uh, tutorial invites you to uh, type in. So I'll go back here and type it here. Well, just pasting it. All right. And let's try to see if this works. So I don't know that Florian actually illustrated this, but you can use this refresh button here to try the experiment on the same page. Oh, this is a, a nice thing that I wanted to show you. There was a problem with the code that was on the tutorial. So maybe we'll fix it later or maybe not. I don't know. It's actually pretty useful. You see here, here that sometimes the code editor will show you uh, uh, red crosses. It helps you detect where there might be a problem here. The first one appears here and says enclosed string. This refers to the fact that here you have a, a quote sign, but that there is no corresponding closing one. So this is what was missing. And that's why I didn't see anything when I clicked refresh. So let's try again. All right. So now it's loading the, the resources. fish swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. This is great. And notice that here it doesn't move to the next trial. So we're not yet to uh, our final result. Um, here, if we look at the code, we have this new key here and um, with a weight and the audio with the weight as well. So what we need to do right now, the, the script is here. It's waiting for a key press on F or J, and then it will reach this thing. And since our audio is um, has is done playing, then it will move to the next trial. Here. The deer runs in a wood which is extremely dense. Right, and now it's the second um, the second trial. So if we take a look back at this template here, we'll see that there are a few bits where we replaced what used to be just a raw string. So here we used to have a file name. And um, here too, and here, and here we used to have a sentence. So now instead of directly having those uh, bits, we actually refer to row, which will look up the table and we look up the audio column of the table, then the sentence, the plural image and singular image. So audios, plural image and singular image are just file names. So if I open it here, you'll see on the first line, for example, that uh, we have an MP3 file name and two PhD file names that correspond to those columns. So that's how we do it. There's also duration for the unfold command, and there is the sense. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> we'll generate four trials because there are four rows per group um, that will use the exact same pattern first playing an audio, then some unfolding of text, images, and a key press. Um, and, and the only 
this that vary are these ones. So it should be pretty simple to use a template command here. So that's that's the general idea. Um, sorry. So now there's a, another thing with tables that that you often want to do is you know uh, when you will be collecting data, you want to um, be able to tell which rows come from which. Uh, uh, row, uh, which um, rows in the results files come from which row from the table, right? So one way of doing it is to use this log command. So this is something that uh, you should pay attention to. Here you see that we already saw some log commands that you use on elements. So this log here makes sure that you will know in the results file when the canvas element was printed. And this will make sure that you know in the results file which key was uh, pressed. But those log commands are specific to elements, right? This is another type of a log command. Uh, you'll notice that it's called on the closing parenthesis of the new trial here. So let me go back to my code. And this is the closing parenthesis of my new trial. And here I have these log commands. So these ones, they will actually add an extra column to your results file with those names, right? And with those values. So here, when I take the experiment until the end and I re generate results, I will see an extra column called group that reports which group from the table was used. So if you remember this table here, group can be A or B. So then when I look at the results file, I'll be able to look at that column and tell whether my participant was assigned group A or group B. Same thing for item, I will know whether it was uh, item one, two, or three, three or four. And inflection, which is this idea of morphology, um, which is actually not contained here. So you'll have a problem here. You'll have an undefined. It won't make your experiment crash. But, oh, no, sorry. I got it wrong. It's here. So right, it's plural versus singular. So you will have either plural or singular. OK, so that's, that's an important um, thing to remember. All right. Okay, so um, next page, customizing an experiment. So far, we've been showing pictures and asking participants to uh, press a key to choose uh, the left versus the right picture. Um, you might want to uh, let them um, choose a picture by clicking it instead or in addition to pressing a key. So the way we'll do this is to use what is called a selector element instead of the key element. And the idea of the selector is that um, it takes elements that you've created before and makes them clickable. So it could be any element. In this case, we'll use image elements, but you could make a text element clickable. You can make a, 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 a video element clickable, anything. Um, and basically it's sort of this disjunction concept where it says, you know, when when you will use wait on it, it will just pause execution until one of those two elements, in this case, is clicked or a key is pressed to select these elements. So that's the other thing that's uh, very useful with the selector element is that you can select the elements that you add to it either by clicking them or by pressing a key that will correspond to them. So let me just copy this bit here. Go back to my uh, experiment. And I will get rid of this key element. We no longer want to simply ask for a key press. Now we'll have this more sophisticated element here, the selector element. And what we do is that we refer back to the image elements that we created before that we actually added to the canvas here. And so at this point here, when the script encounters this line, it will actually make the image elements clickable. And then when it encounters this line, it will uh, detect key presses on F or J, and F will be associated with the first element in this line here, so with the plural image, and J will be associated with second element, singular. We again have logs so that we know which element was um, selected, and once makes sure that uh, you cannot change your mind later, because notice that you have weight here, but if you select an image before the end of the audio, playback, um, in theory, until the audio is done playing, you would have time to change your mind. So the once make sure that once you've clicked or pressed the key, that's it, you can't, you can't uh, change your mind. So let, 
let's open in a new tab just to see the effect of this thing. Here, I clicked the left image and you see that uh, it was selected. All right. But there is a problem here. So that, oh, that, that's good. Actually, let me tell you something. Um, here, the experiment crashed. There is no very helpful uh, error message anywhere. What happened is that uh, when your experiment starts with a trial with some automatic audio playback, most browsers will actually prevent audio playback. It's just a, you know, um, anti-add measure. Um, normally, uh, you would have a trial before that, which I failed to copy here. So I will just add this very simple trial with the start button here. And that should take care of it. Let's refresh. The fish swim here. in a tank, which is perfectly round. The deer runs in a here. wood, which is extremely dense. The sheep right. roam in a pen, which is strikingly blue. OK. So you get the idea. All right. Um, good. So then there's, again, some CSS uh, for aesthetics consideration. I will uh, not go over it. But what I will do is just I will copy this uh, instructions trial here just to uh, have my experiment up to date with the tutorial. All right, so then there is something about creating a timeout. The general idea is to use timers. I won't go over this thing here, even though it's it's quite useful, but you can, you can go back to it. But I will still um, illustrate how timer elements work because you know it's, it's, a, it's a useful feature in experimental designs. Here we'll just, before playing the audio and showing anything, we'll add a one second delay at the very beginning of the experiment. So I'll just copy this bit here and edit before the audio element. Notice the red cross here, which uh, actually informs me that I forgot to have a, a comma here. All right. And now that I have it, it should actually add a one second delay. The fish here. swim in a tank, which is perfectly round. See, there's the a one second delay a wood, which is every trial. So one thing that is important with those timers is that creating them is not enough as for, as with any element, you need first to start the timer and you need to wait until it's um, it's uh, elapsed before moving on to the next um, uh, line of script. All right, so let's try to, to, uh, to move on. I won't go over the completion screen here. Um, there's an important feature here, which is counterbalancing. Um, so first there is, uh, you know, there are uh, multiple ways or multiple things you might want to counterbalance or shuffle in your experiment. One thing is the position of the images on the screen. So this is pretty simple here because you already have a selector that contains the images themselves. There is a simple command here that will actually randomize the position of these two um, elements. It's just a shuffle command that you call, can call on the selector. So by default here, the plural image is on the left of the canvas and the singular one is on the right. The shuffle will actually randomly reassign these two positions. An important note here, remember that the script is executed uh, top down, which means that the shuffle command comes before the keys command. So whichever uh, image element will end up on the left will be associated with F and whichever ends up on the right will be associated with J. Had you added shuffle after this, then the key association would have remained. So F would always have been with plural and J with singular. And if plural ended up on the right, for example, it would have been uh, F that you would press to uh, select it, which doesn't make quite much sense in this case. So uh, we want to have shuffle before it. So, you know, order is important. So this is pretty simple. You can do it um, with, again, with any kind of element. It's something useful to, to have in, to keep in mind. Um, then another pretty important uh, uh, thing that you should be able to randomize is uh, the order of your trials. So let me scroll up a little bit here and see this new trial uh, command. Here you see that we label every single trial that is generated from the template command. We, we assign all of them the exact same uh, uh, label. The label is experimental trial. 
So this is something you can use to actually uh, control when your um, um, trials appear in the sequence of your experiment. Uh, the other trial we have in this uh, project is one that's called instructions. That's its label. So when you want to control the sequence of trials, uh, when they appear and how they appear in your experiment, you can use this command sequence. And inside sequence, inside its parenthesis, you refer to the labels of the trials. So here, I'll just add instructions. So what will happen here is that at the very beginning of my experiment, the very first trial to be executed will be the one that is labeled instructions. And then I can have experimental trial. So this here, having just this uh, string here, refers to all the label, all the trials that are labeled experimental trial. So with this sequence command, I would have first this trial and then all the four trials that were generated in the order in which they were generated. If you want to have them in a random, uh, randomized order, you simply use this randomized command here and you have the label inside the randomized command. And now the four trials that are labeled experimental trial, they will appear in a random order after the, label, the trial instructions. All right. Okay. And so finally, uh, let me go back here. Remember what I told you that the table uh, that we imported has two um, um, groups, right? Group A and group B. By default, pan controller has a, uh, uh, an internal counter, which is incremented whenever someone finishes the experiment. So um, the very first time you take the experiment, you will be assigned group A. And wh whenever you finish the experiment, the next people who take it will be assigned group B. And when they finish it, then the next participants will be assigned group A again. So it cycles through the groups using an internal counter. This is how it works by default. There are ways of controlling that. I won't go over them right now, but um, it's, uh, it's all described here. So you should make sure to um, read this part if you're interested in that. All right. Um, okay, the participant information, um, maybe I can try to go over it very quickly. Um, yeah, let me try to do that. Okay, so here I'll just copy this thing here, this trial, and paste it in my code, replace the one I had here. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, this is this all should be pretty uh, familiar to you right now. There might be a few commands that you know we skipped over. Um, but there is this important element here, the text input, which lets people, uh, participants in your experiment, type in some text. And what we do here is, you know, we, we print this input box, then we have a button to uh, move over to the next trial. But before we actually move over to the next trial, so after this means, you know, the button has been clicked. When the button has been clicked, before really moving on to the next trial, we have this bit of code here. This is a var element. Um, and notice this line here where we say set get text input input ID. The effect of this line is to actually store the text that was input in this element. It will store the text inside this var element that we've named ID and that we've made global. When we do that, then what we can do is actually um, go back to the closing parenthesis of a trial and use the lock command that we saw before and actually refer to it. So here we can do get var id, and this will add a column to our results file containing the value that was input in the text input because we stored it in this var element. And what is nice about it is that notice that inside our template command, we'll also have a new trial. So we can you know, go here and do the same thing here. And this will work because the var element is global. So it, it persists through whole, the, the whole experiment. So now all our um, results uh, lines, the lines in our results file will have this extra column um, reflecting the text that was input in the, in the input box. 
All right, so that's one way of collecting IDs. There is another way that I won't go over uh, of collecting ID, which is to pass it as part of the URL, which is an option for you know, recruiting platforms like Sona or Prolific. You can pass the participant's, I the participant's ID directly in the URL and there are ways of um, handling that too, but I won't go over that. All right, um, very quickly, I will um, take a, a test run of, of this uh, experiment just to take a look at the um, results file so you can see the extract columns and all those things. All right, so let me open it in a new tab here. Okay, so here you see this uh, first screen. I will type my name here. The fish swim in a tank which here, is perfectly so round. The sheep roam in a pen which is strikingly blue. The moose walks in a park which is visibly new. The deer runs in a right. wood which is extremely dense. And here the results have been sent. So now let's go back to the uh, projects page and click results. And here you can see that every single line has this uh, column here which is the column number 13, participant ID, this is Jeremy, this is what I typed. And the other ones here, the ones that were generated from the uh, template command, they also have other columns, one group item and condition, and you can see them here. I was running group A, and this is item one, three, um, four, and two, because we randomized them, and condition, which is plural, singular, um, singular here. All right. Um, I think that's uh, some some said. I think that's about it. Um, right here, there's the debug of uh, that you can um, you know add this command when you're ready, but only when you're ready to run um, actual participants. Because whenever you uh, edit your project, you might have problems. So make sure that's I, I don't remember if Florian mentioned it, but it's a very important thing that I want to I want to stress. Please keep this thing open here. Most of the time, you. Uh, you know, when everything runs smoothly, you're like, you, you don't like it, well, just close it here when you take your test run. But still, you know, keeping it open and, and not using the debug off until you're completely ready to run your experiment is very useful because you might have uh, messages showing up in errors, which will help you tremendously troubleshoot what's going wrong with your experiment. And also this tab here, the log tab, uh, gives you uh, a very detailed log of what's happening. So it, it's also very useful in troubleshooting your experiment. So please use a debugger when you debug your experiment. You'll, it will save you time and, and you know, uh, uh, efforts in troubleshooting your experiment. Um, yeah, I think, I think we've covered uh, most of, of what is in the advanced tutorial. Florian, if you want to take over. Um, sure, yes, I was <laughs> busy in the Q&A, but I'll happily pass it sure. on to you. Uh, so um, go ahead and, and take that. So um, we're happy to take more questions. There's a, a number of questions on sort of sequencing things. Um, and Jeremy may want to chime in on those um, too, just in terms of alternating, say, uh, fillers and critical items. Um, so the short story in a way is that all the counterbalancing functionality here um, is really um, what is already provided by the original IBEX by Alex Drummond. If you've used that, then you're familiar with it. Um, if not, um, a lot of good documentation is there. So there's a lot of flexibility in the sequence command in particular, um, where you can use um, the, uh, should be R shuffle, right, Jeremy? Where, so you could um, take, you know, mark all your things in your spreadsheet as either a filler or a critical trial, add that as a label, and then uh, simply say that you want to shuffle filler type trials and critical uh, trial type trials. Um, and then it will precisely do that alternation while each time sort of filling that slot randomly from the list that's um, presented. Um, if people want to, I know in these webinar formats it can get uh, awkward. If you guys want to ask some live questions, we could take a few minutes um, for that as well. We can you can ask to be unmuted. Um, maybe put that in the chat rather than the Q and A. Then we can um, uh, see that there and we can find you and do that. Otherwise, we can just talk a little bit more about the questions that are coming in in the Q and A. Jeremy, do you want to jump in? Sure. Sorry, I was just typing uh, some answers. 
All right, so did you say we should actually start taking uh, answering questions live, is what you said? Yeah, just so there's a bunch uh, in there. We will try to get to all the questions in follow-up if we don't get to them during the webinar right now. Um, we'll probably post them on the forum. Just look on the announcement page. We'll tell you how to find things. Um, but uh, as a quick, quick in-between between this part and the second part, I think we're, we're happy to answer questions. And again, if you'd like to um, actually be unmuted, feel free to put yourself put a shout out in the chat and otherwise we can just uh, talk a little bit more about the things that are coming up in the Q&A. Right. Oh, All right, the so, chat is disabled, sorry. Okay, I'll start answering some questions from the Q&A. Um, yeah, so there was a question about uh, font types. That's that's actually something, if you know a little bit of CSS and I know we've uh, actually skimmed over those um, commands, but you can simply use a CSS command and uh, use the font type rule to actually change the, the font of, of whatever text element you're uh, dealing with. Then there are a little bit more uh, advanced questions about uh, controlling the order of the different uh, items. Well, all those things, you know, uh, again, um, I should probably share the, the link to um, uh, the, the original IBEX documentation on the chat here. Uh, there are a few uh, functions that you can use to uh, control the order of the, of the items based on their uh, labels. And you can also write uh, custom functions. So here you would need to know uh, JavaScript to do that. Um, if you look up the forums, um, you know, the TCIVX forums, then you'll find that some of them, uh, some, some posts actually have uh, custom functions to that uh, effect. So let me actually share the links to the forums with you um, here. All right, let me put it in the chat. All right. Um, So um, so I see a question about um, granting credits to Sona participants. Um, We've done that before. I think what you can do from Sona, I mean, depending on, on the specific setup, but um, I think you can pass the experiment ID and the survey ID, the participants ID, uh, as part of the URL to your experiment. And then from PCI Bex, you can retrieve those values using a command that's called uh, get URL parameter. And after you do that, you can actually reuse those um, values in a, in a simple link that you insert on the final screen of your experiment. This way, people can click the link and be redirected to the Sony platform and be automatically granted credits. So that, that's one way of doing it. Uh, there, it's not you know, a simple just you know, uh, uh, module that will do it automatically for you as you know, JSI apparently does according to the question, but th there's a way of, of, of handling it. Okay, well, in the uh, interest of time, and I know that many of you are here because you're excited to learn about more advanced functionalities, um, maybe we'll um, continue in our program and uh, adjust some, uh, uh, address some more uh, advanced issues and address the questions that are still open um, as we go along um, in writing. Um, and if we don't get to it within the webinar, we'll, we'll follow up with you afterwards. And in some cases, as you'll see, we may just have to say, okay, let's follow up on that later because things are getting too complicated or we need to know more from you. Um, so um, there are um, a number of advanced things we can get into. Um, there's quite a few from the uh, uh, registration forms, quite a few participants interested in self-paced reading. Um, that's actually something quite 
simple in a certain sense, um, or was simple for us because the original IBEX farm already had all that. Uh, but maybe Jeremy can walk us through one of the templates. Um, if you go to the farm, there actually is a template for a self-based reading experiment. And it essentially shows you how to use the um, self-based reading controller, as it's called, um, from the original IBEX farm and integrated on PC IBEX. Maybe you want to just share your screen and walk through that sure. template, Jeremy. Yep. And then after that, we will get to issues relating to eye tracking, um, audio video recording, and mouse tracking. There's some general things to say, but then also some particulars. But we also have now, as you see in the list here, um, sample projects that you can also um, uh, check out to see how these things are coded. These come with limited functionality to some extent, of course, just because, um, again, they require some advanced setup, but the sample projects here, the templates still give you a first sense for, for what these sorts of things will look like. Sure, okay. Yeah. Okay, so here I'm on farm.pcibex.net. And there is a list of projects, and there's a new project, and there's uh, one here that's called self-paced reading. If I click this button here, I open a new tab to try it, so I can see, you know, what the experiment looks like. So we already saw that with the advanced tutorial, we can ask some um, ID uh, value here, and then this is what actually trial looks like with the self-paced reading uh, module. You have those uh, blank um, uh, words here, and as you start typing, pressing the key, uh, the space bar, you uh, read. You know, you move to the next word, right? So this is not a real experiment at all, as you can tell. You know, it's just a demonstration of, of the self very basic self based reading functionality. So I'll just um, click here to edit a copy of the experiment, just to see what the code looks like. So all of this is not really like crucial for the, the core of the self-paced reading experiment. It's just, you know, some uh, instructions and all those things. So let's scroll down to the interesting bit, which is this one here. Um, so just some text elements, buttons, all this thing, you know, you, you should already be familiar with. And the way to insert some self-paced reading uh, uh, component in your experiment is to use this new controller. So controller elements are just ways of injecting some native IBEX functionalities into your pen controller experiment. So here I make reference to uh, a controller type that was created by Alex Drummond, which is called dash sense. Uh, it's actually, you know, here, you don't have to, you know, uh, look at it, but just so you know, you know, it's a module that was written by Alex. And then actually, if you look up uh, the native IBEX, the original IBEX documentation, you will learn a little bit about how to use it. But the very basic uh, idea is, you know, you have this dash sense here. Here you need to use a curly bracket, S um, column, and then here you type your sentence and we'll just you know, detect uh, every single word and take care for you uh, of, you know, um, of splitting them and, and printing them as blank words. Uh, of course, you know, as with any other elements, creating it is not enough, you need to print it. So here, if you do, once you do print, you'll see it on the screen. Log will make sure that you'll have one line in your results by per word that is being shown on the screen with timestamps and delays and all those things. So you can reconstruct when each word was, you know, appeared on the screen. And weight is also important because in, uh, in the absence of it here, you would immediately remove it from the screen. So that, that, that's not great. Or even without remove here, if you don't have it, then the button will appear immediately as soon as you print the controller. So wait means, you know, actually the script uh, stays here until you've uh, revealed the whole sentence. And once you reveal the whole sentence, it moves to the next one. And here it actually takes the uh, element of the screen. And then you have this button here. So if one thing that I often see people ask is how do I ask a question, you know, about like, was this sentence easy to read or something like that? Well, it's, you know, just a standard um, a pen control experiment. You can say, you know, um, how easy was this sentence you know, to read? And you just have this text element and you print it, right? And then um, there is something that's called the scale. So you can use a scale 
and you can name uh, easy, I don't know, with a, maybe it's a seven, a seven point scale, you print it and you wait for it, right? That would be one way of having a, well, you know, an easiness question after uh, showing the, the um, dash sentence, you know, the, the self-paced reading sentence. Um, I mean, I, I can actually uh, demonstrate it. So here, I'll just show you something that's quite useful with the debugger. I can uh, click sequence here and move directly to this experiment trial. So here I have my question, my, sorry, my uh, sentence. And now I have this question here. So you can add labels, right? Because here it doesn't make much sense, but there are ways of adding labels. So maybe it was very easy to read. Makes sense, right? Okay, so that was the very basic demonstration of a self-paced reading experiment. You can customize things, you know, if you go to uh, Ibex's documentation, you'll see that there are different ways you can have, instead of having the whole sense with you know, blank words, you can have one word at a time on the screen, you, know, you can uh, play with those settings. Florian, was there anything you wanted to add on this um, self-paced reading template? Um, so let's see, there's just, oh, for self-paced listening. Um, there's more questions coming in. So I imagine people may have questions. I didn't have anything in particular to add um, myself. Um, right, let's see. Oops. So in terms of self-paced listening, you cannot use the dash sentence uh, controller oh, right. written by Alex to do it. Um, there, you, you would have, you know, it, it is possible to code it yourself, but you, uh, you know, it requires a little bit of programming. So it is definitely feasible. Um, if you know in advance how many words you'll have. So, you know, having, um, you know, the, the, the easiest ways of, of implementing it would be to have one audio file per word. And if you know in advance how many files you have, then you can just you know play the audio wait, then play the next audio wait, and this kind of things. You know, after a key press, that would be a very very easy way of doing it. Then there are there are ways of uh, making it more automatic, but that would necessarily require some uh, programming. It's not it's not built uh, built in function. Yeah. Okay, so if there isn't more in terms of questions on self-paced reading um, per se, um, so that's when we answered live. Right, so th this. there was one question about having ah. one word, uh, uh, each word on the same spot on the screen. I, I take that. I take it that it means you know one word at a time on the screen or something. That's then you know you should actually look up the Ibex documentation. There are ways of customizing, you know, of changing the settings and instead of having a long um, sense, then you can have one word at a time and these kind of things. So yes, yeah, this is funny, funny. The, certainly Alex Jarman's original IBEX had a lot of uh, versatility in that regard and that's all pretty well documented. Uh, since that was already there, we've not focused that much on, well, either adding to it because other than just integrating it like we showed here. Um, and, and probably our documentation is a little thin on some of these things as well, but the original documentation is available and you can do anything that you can do there um, here as well. So there are a number of different um, self-paced formats that you can use. Um, so that, that should be dealt with, yeah, that's right. So same thing about uh, instead of asking people to press a button, you can have a you know, timeout. That's again, you should look at the documentation on, on you know, the IBEX documentation. It, it, there's a way of you know, having a timeout, like maybe after you know, 200 milliseconds moves to the next word. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. Well, we're getting on 2.30 and um, probably should uh, make sure to get to some of these other functionalities, maybe as a general introduction um, of that. So uh, we have, you know, audio and video recording, eye tracking, and also mouse tracking. Um, all of these involve in one way or another um, much more um, uh, extensive writing of data to somewhere, right? To put it briefly. So if you're recording, you have the recorded files and so on. Um, and with eye tracking, you have a larger amount of um, 
uh, uh, data to write with the uh, um, gaze that's com uh, gaze position as it's comp computed and so on. Um, and in light of the current setup and, and also current um, you know, resource limitations, and all of this is made available for free, we're not able to add, just have you write you know, 300 megabyte video files for 100 participants onto the farm. We don't have that sort of hosting capacity here. However, um, it is, the capacity is all there for all of these things. Um, and the um, thing you need in order to really start using that sort of thing is a place to put all that stuff and uh, to put all those files and, and, and all that data. Um, so that's really the main additional setup piece that's required um, for, for all of these things. Um, so it's not hard these days um, to set up a server. You need to have control over certain technical parts that Jeremy can maybe say a few words about in a moment. Um, uh, unfortunately, it does not work to you know, interface with something like Dropbox or other sort of commercially available online storage type of systems. You really need um, a server where you have access um, to certain types of script files and, and things that you can set where essentially you allow PC IBEX to write to those locations and then you have the storage there. Um, so um, that's sort of the general thing that's needed for all of these more advanced functionalities. And maybe we should start out by Jeremy saying a bit um, about that in general terms, what you need, what might be some options. And then we can, again, uh, afterwards, maybe take uh, a look at a number of the template experiments that we now have on the farm that will illustrate um, how the code works on the uh, PC IBEX side to make these things happen. There's not really that much additional there. You just need this additional tie-in and tie-in and then have additional types of elements and commands to execute um, these types of things. But yeah, maybe Jeremy, you uh, speak to the, broadly speaking, the server setup things that you need. Sure. Um, so basically, for both uh, audio and video recording and uh, collecting eye tracking data, you will need to have your own uh, web server, basically. So for those of you who are a little bit familiar with it, it could be an Apache server. And there are ways of, I think, of configuring some, for example, some Amazon setup with some Lambda function, those things. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, the documentation here has this how-to guides section that will guide you through setting up a web server. So uh, web servers refer to things that are not Dropbox or um, Google Drive or those things. There are things where you can have, for example, a PHP script. So both the audio video recordings and the eye tracking data that will need a PHP script or a Lambda function on the Amazon setup, for example, to actually receive and process uh, the data that's incoming and store it on your own um, server space. So if I go here on uh, recording audio and video, you see there are instructions and here there is a PHP script. So, uh, and, and you should have the same thing for collecting eye tracking data. Um, there is a PHP script here. So when you have your own web server and you are able to upload and execute PHP scripts, it's not that complicated. You basically just need to create that PHP script that, that is here. You know, you copy and paste the code and then you upload it there. And once you have uh, your uh, PHP script uploaded to your uh, server space, then you can use the farm, the public farm and create your own uh, project and start uh, uh, referring to that PHP script. So let's, uh, let me illustrate this uh, uh, audio recording thing here. So I'll just uh, try it first to show you, you know, what it looks like. So the very first thing that happens is that it asks me for uh, access to my microphone. So I granted access. And then this is a very simple uh, experiment where I just ask people to uh, say a number of words in 10 seconds. So I have to think of words that start with the letter R and I'll have 10 seconds to, to, say, to say them. So, I can say retail, uh, rally, uh, racing, um, I don't know what else, rolling. It's, it's hard to come up with words. But 10 seconds later, as you can see here, um, you know, it's uh, the, uh, recording stops. Here you have this thing that says not recording, but I can play it back. I can say retail, right. uh, rally, uh, racing. Um, 
All right, and if I go to the next one, I have the same thing with the letter P. So uh, nothing fancy here, but it's actually a simple illustration of media recording. So let's take a look at what the code of this experiment looks like here. So uh, there are a few things. There is the sequence command that you already know, a little bit you know, uh, uh, fancy uh, uh, function here. And there is this part here, which is uh, um, initiate recorder is the command that you use to inform your script, to inform pen controller where the recordings should be sent. So in this case, you know, because this is just an illustration experiment, I'm using a dummy URL, but the PHP scripts that I showed you from the um, documentation are the ones that you should upload to your own web server. And then you should have this part here, you should replace it with a URL that points to your PHP scripts. Right? And remember that when I took the experiment, I had this, um, permission requirement where, where you know, the browser was asking me for uh, access to my microphone. Well, this is actually trial. This is, that is generated by this command here and you can give it a label here in it, right? And so I refer the reference the label here so that the very first trial that we saw when we took the experiment was something that asked me for, you know, access to my microphone. So you have this uh, initiate recorder here Upload recordings is uh, actually creates trials that will upload the recordings, as it says. Um, and the, the important thing here is this bit here. So there is this media recorder element in time controller that lets you access the microphone and or the webcam. In this case, the second argument that I give to this new media recorder command is audio. So I just tell my experiment that I only want to record audio and not uh, video. You could have video or you could have um, something else. And remember, you should look up the <laughs> documentation. We can have both if you need. Um, and then I have this um, record a command here. So basically, once you press the start button, then it will start recording immediately. Then I have this uh, 10,000 milliseconds, so 10 second timer, uh, at the end of which I actually stop my media recorder element. And you'll notice that this is a template, so I'll, I'll actually do it twice because here I have two letters, T and R. So that, that's the gist of using um, the media recorder element. It should be simple enough, really the, um, you know, um, the part that's, is maybe more demanding is setting up the servers. Um, hopefully the instructions are clear enough on the documentation, but you know you, you need to be a little bit familiar with um, web servers and these kind of things to in order to do that. Um, is there uh, anything I should add or yeah. No, I see a highly relevant question. So can you run PC IBEX experiments entirely on our own server? So this is a question to ask her due to data protection rules, um, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, the original IBEX farm is, uh, is open source available. The PC IBEX farm, I think, will be where it's too new for us to have actually shared the full code. Um, so that that may be to be updated, Jeremy can uh, say more to that. Um, but you can definitely set up your own farm. Um, and it is certainly true in general um, that for audio video recording, um, same goes for eye tracking, anything, all these things get into areas where the data you collect is somewhat more sensitive and IRB requirements may uh, require you to have more explicit control or you know, actually ownership of where the data gets written to. Um, so at 10, we've recently, in parallel with the development of this farm, actually for that reason, created uh, another instance of the farm um, for pen users that's tied into um, Amazon S3 bucket setups that are, that are set up through pens computing. And so um, that allows us to record more um, sensitive type of data. So this is definitely possible. Um, it requires a good bit more setup and work. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have. We're not, you know, ready to um, help <laughs> with that full setup since that gets pretty involved, but we're more than happy to share general information about how we did it and what you might need to take into account. And we can also point you um, to the places where you can find information about, say, setting up your own, own farm. Jeremy, do you want to add anything to that? 
No, I think that that covers, covers it all. And as a just illustration, I guess, um, or, or elaboration on that rather, um, with that sort of specific setup, when you you know tying in directly, say, so we we're using with with Amazon Web Services, um, where the farm is now also hosted. So then that makes the whole server side um, unnecessary. So for those of you that are pen users here, um, right, the uh, we can get you set up on the pen farm, and then you're actually able to write data, video, audio data, and so on directly to your own Amazon S3 bucket within the pen Amazon space. Um, and so that actually streamlines things further. Again, we're not able to offer that as a service to the general public and to some extent that would sort of uh, undermine the point of having it in a more confined, more restricted space with additional security. Um, but with these advanced functionalities, that definitely seems to be something that is much uh, called for and, and absolutely possible. Um, Jeremy, you might be able to speak to this one. It'd be useful to have general tech specs about minimum server requirements so that one can buy or set up a suitable one. I'm sure we can't get into all the details, but anything general you could say? Sorry, so the question is about how much space you need for in order to set this up, right? M minimum server requirements, types of setups. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of factors at play here. Um, it really depends on, uh, you know, how long each audio recording is and how many of them you will have and how many participants you will uh, recruit, right? So, um, but, uh, you know, in the end, the, well, <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard to, to really answer it. Um, if, if you have only like, I don't know, one trial where you record a 10 seconds, you know, what you just saw, for example, it's a two trial experiment with, you know, each recording is only 10 seconds. And if you only run uh, 10 or 20 participants, then it's, it's nothing, right? Like you don't need much server space. But uh, if you have, if you, for example, if you um, first, something you probably shouldn't do is um, ask your participants to read or, you know, come up with, with some, uh, story that lasts uh, minutes, like 10 minutes, 20, 30, an hour long. If you have one recording, a single recording that's that long, then chances are that it will be huge as a file and you just won't be able to send it to your server. So because first, even if your server accepts such a big file, it will take forever to upload it. And then, you know, it will take so much time that the, you know, chances that something goes wrong and, and upload is interrupted is, you know, increases dramatically. So as, you know, the general guideline here is try to have uh, short recordings that you upload uh, regularly. So uh, you very briefly saw the upload recordings command in the code. That's something you should use to asynchronously upload recordings after every single trial so that you know you can actually keep the experiment running and and have the the files sent to your servers but um it's it's hard to tell but generally you know you can you can actually try your experiment yourself but um i would say and many actually many configurations of what servers will uh, prevent you from uploading files that are bigger than 100 or 200 megabytes and you know if your recording is 10 minute long then probably you know it will be around that that size so so i just say maybe yeah. also there's there's different types of restrictions here right i mean you can easily and for not that much money buy lots and lots of storage space on a server so storing many gigabytes of data there may not be the issue um the more of a bottleneck probably really is what jeremy was just alluding to um right getting everything all the the entire experiment, as we've hopefully made clear before, will right, run locally on the participant's um, machine. That's good for timing types of things because internet speed doesn't affect anything. But in the end, of course, we need to get the data from them. And with the recording, it's precisely the getting data from the participant end to your server where you're storing it. Um, that, that can be sort of the bottleneck. And if you, again, like Jeremy just said, if you wait till the end and you're having to send several hundred megabytes, depending on connection, people may time out. Um, so doing it intermittently may be better. So I see you know, three minutes uh, of video and audio for 18 participants. It, it really depends on um, 
uh, I wouldn't know off the top of my head right now how big a three minute video will be uh, generated through the webcam. It may be fine. It may just be something to try out. Again, the, the sending may be the bottleneck. Um, a useful backup. So a lot of these things right are new. We're still looking for ways of how to do things. A useful backup that is definitely built in. I, I don't know whether I may have missed it if Jeremy spoke to it before, but you can set things up so that if the uploading of the data fails, um, the participant can get basically a link to uh, that invites them to download whatever recording uh, they generated um, locally. And then you may have to track them down and see how they can upload it. Maybe then you can you know, ask them to put it on a Dropbox. That's obviously not as streamlined and automated as you would like it to be. But if that's the only way you could ultimately get the data um, rather than it be lost, that's sort of a fallback strategy when there are upload type of issues, right? So, so um, I think we're still in the early stages of finding out what the best strategies for all of these things are. And, and a lot of it is also just going to be trial and error and you see what you can make work with your setup and interface as you get it started. So maybe um, we should segue to eye tracking, which I know many of you are excited about. Um, mouse tracking also was uh, something people were interested in. In some ways, it's not that different uh, uh, in terms of the nature of the type of stuff you collect, uh, right? Gaze position versus mouse position. Um, so we'll see if we have time for both, but I think we should start with eye tracking because um, a lot of people obviously were very um, interested in that and, and very excited about that. Um, so uh, again, just to be clear, right, the WebGazer API, this is not ours, but it easily ties into um, PC IBEX and um, one of the templates now here is an eye tracking experiment. Um, and it's, you know, as you can imagine, uh, much more limited than a fancy eye tracker in your lab, um, but it's also a lot cheaper, namely free. Um, and so, uh, and it's a lot easier say to get a lot of sub subjects. So there is a lot of potential. Um, there's only some initial attempts um, here of people that, that have done actual data collection. Um, and there's again, lots of open questions still. So in principle, it's the same strategy as usual, right? The, uh, the, the webcam image is analyzed for face and eye and uh, position and you calibrate it looking at different points in the screen and then it tries its best to uh, uh, compute um, what position you're looking at. You should be able to try that out with the, uh, if you test run the eye tracker um, template, so you can get a sense of that um, uh, for yourself. Um, broadly speaking, right, this is not going to be the right thing to uh, have like uh, display change reading experiments where when you get to one character, the next character turns over. That's not the level we're talking about. But if you have two images on the screen, maybe four, um, right, which quadrant of the screen screen are you looking at at that it might be quite good and, and, and good enough. Um, there is additional right strategic issues. Some people don't calibrate well, just like they, you know, not everybody calibrates super well on an eye tracker in, in the lab. And there's questions what you do with that. Um, there's one useful strategy um, that some people um, have, have tried out where you sort of think of a setup where you try the eye tracker. And if the calibration is really poor, what you do is you resort to just a plain video recording. And that video can be analyzed in the manual hand, uh, sort of old fashioned way of somebody, you know, NRA just going through and categorizing frames um, manually, where are you looking left half of the screen, right half of the screen, right? Um, so what exactly is the most um, efficient? Um, people are still working on it. We have a couple of people here that I think have done this already. So they may be able to chime in. Um, but uh, maybe Jeremy can, can turn just to a quick illustration of what the projects look like for an eye tracking experiment. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um, just a quick note, the eye tracking uh, library works best on Chrome. I've recently been able to use it on Firefox and my Firefox, but it's sometimes very slow. And I don't think it ever works on Safari or Edge or other browsers. So. You know, if you're thinking of actually using it, you should probably tell your participants to use Chrome if they can, or just not take the experiment at all if they don't have Chrome. Um, all right, so again, you know, uh, this is a template here. I can use this icon to start it. Um, you'll notice that I took my glasses off because, you know, uh, glasses uh, actually don't work very well with the eye tracker. Uh, again, as was the case for the uh, audio recording experiment here, uh, the browser asks for access to the webcam this time. 
So I give it access to my webcam. I here I click I understand. Ah, something's happening. That's that usually doesn't happen. Am I running on Chrome? <laughs> it's all right. Oh no, I know what's happening. I'm pretty sure. Okay, I, I was hoping I could demonstrate it for you, but um uh, I'm actually my webcam is currently being used with Zoom. So something I never <laughs> tried before, but we just learned that you can't apparently, you know, this uh, library is not compatible with your webcam being used uh, by something else at the same time. So yeah, we won't be able to, I won't be able to demonstrate it for you right now. Um, you can try to take it yourself, uh, assuming your webcam is not already activated for something else. Uh, just try to use Chrome and uh, follow the instructions. Let me just go quickly, uh, like take a quick look at the code just to see uh, what happens. So this is just a way of retrieving some resource files from a distant server. Uh, again, I told you uh, before, right, with uh, eye tracking data, you will need to set up a PHP script or some way of retrieving the data. So here again, it's a dummy URL, but you should point to your own. Um, PHP script here. Then the way you do it is, as with anything in pen controller, you create a, a certain type of element. Here is the eye tracker element. And this is a, a particular, you know, something that we didn't see before, but the wait commands can take some things that we call test commands in it. So here it just says that the button will accept clicks, you know, will validate clicks on it only when the eye tracker element is ready. And this line here makes sure to ask uh, permission, like access to the webcam. So once the access to webcam has been granted, then a click on uh, this button will actually proceed. Here you can go full screen. And then there is this important bit here, which is a calibrate function. If you've used uh, physical eye trackers before you know, in the lab, you remember like you, you know that there is a calibration phase and in this case, the 50 here, this number means uh, that 50% of the look estimated looks should fall on the target. So it's not a great threshold because it basically means that, you know, about 50% of the looks will be off and it will still, you know, proceed and consider that it's good enough. But, you know, whenever I took this uh, um, um, demonstration, experiment uh, before, the 50% threshold was enough to actually distinguish between the four quadrants. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to generate reliable, you know, good enough data of good enough quality. And this two here means that you have two or three attempts, I remember, uh, before the experiment gives up and says, you know, well, you can't take the experiment because, you know, or actually will proceed, but it won't collect high tracking data if, if you fail more than twice. And then uh, on the, you know, during the specific, the, the trials themselves, again, you need to uh, have your eye tracker calibrated at the beginning of every single trial. Um, it will actually, you know, when you take it uh, with this calibrate command here, um, you will start by just looking at a button at the center of the screen for three seconds. If, and, and during that time, then the eye tracker will measure uh, the calibration score. If the calibration score is good enough, then you won't go through the calibration phase. If it is poor, in this case, if it falls under 50%, then you will go through a new calibration phase to recalibrate the tracker, which uh, consists in clicking on nine buttons on different edges and you know, corners of the screen. And then it will proceed here to the, the actual trial. And you'll notice that at some point here, I add elements to my eye tracker. I start it, and at this point, you know, the eye tracker starts recording which elements you're looking at. And you know, there's this log command here that is important. And after the participant has made a selection here, I stop the eye tracker because you know um, it collects a lot of data, right? Every uh, cycle, so it's like I think every you know about every uh, 16 milliseconds it will collect data. So you don't want to run it for too long. So stop it as soon as you can to uh, you know, prevent uh, using too much uh, resource and also you know, uh, uh, limiting the, the size of the data that you collect. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say about this eye tracker, which is you know, uh, there, is a, there is a guide, a how-to guide on the documentation. So you can go back to it to learn more about it. But something 
that helps with uh, actually capturing the looks, even though you know the tracker is not perfect. So sometimes it will um, have wrong estimates of where you're looking at. In order to maximize the number of looks that are uh, captured to your elements, one trick that I, I use here that I think is also used with you know physical eye trackers is that the elements that I'm interested in, I actually include them in a larger, bigger area. And I look for looks on those bigger areas. So even if you know uh, the estimated looks of the participants is of the actual target element, it will still fall in the surrounding area and will still be captured as a look on that element. So that's something, but it's, it, that's something that's described in the documentation as well. Um, Right, and Jeremy, then, you know, you'll, yeah. I was just gonna point out okay. that Mika had the suggestion of trying to turn off your Zoom webcam uh, video sure. and seeing yeah, if it works that. then, um, that's worth it. And, uh, Mika also has some experiences. If she wants to join in, she's welcome to. If not, that's okay too, but she has worked with the eye tracker element. Oh, yeah, it works. Ah, All right, great. Thank it you would have been ironic if the virtual web uh, eye tracking cannot be, can only be demonstrated in person. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this is the calibration phase. I'll try to remain still, and hopefully, me talking at the same time won't confuse the eye tracker because you know it detects your mouth. Um, so let me click on the buttons here. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. And here, we'll look for three seconds. All right, so apparently it worked. So I'll go to the first trial. As I said, you know, there's this three second calibration check first. All right. Use the Game Master's this is comment a trial. about Hannah and the house she's going to join to figure the out which player The hasn't started Hannah. yet. And now it has Only started. Hannah is joining the chosen house of diamonds. So as you can see, there is a purple frame around the characters that I'm looking at. This you can turn off. It's just for demonstration purposes that I added this uh, purple um, square. And here, this is probably Hannah. And that's that's it. I'll just do one one trial, but you know, you get the idea. But that part, it really is. You know, if you just try it out, and you should be able to try it out on your own. Having that purple frame around it gives you a sense for the extent to which you know the frame is around the image you're looking at, and. Even though the calibration and the quality here is obviously not great, if you work with in-lab eye trackers, um, it's it's when you do it that way. I do feel like you know, oh yeah, it does uh, know where I'm looking. Um, Mika, do you want to share any experiences? Um, you've done a bunch of piloting in getting ready for data collection with this. Anything you want to share? You should be able to talk as a since you're a panelist for the conference. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I can also turn off my webcam even. I think. Sure. Um, so yeah, uh, I'd be happy to share some experiences. So I didn't do any full collect data collection of a uh, Fisher World experiment yet, um, but I did do a lot of pilot testing, as you said. Um, and I think the main issue that I've, I've come across is actually in calibration. Uh, so some of the participants um, are just not able to calibrate, as Jeremy also already said. Um, and for some of your participants, I don't even know why. Uh, so, for instance, one of my colleagues is just she uses the same the same laptop as I do uh, with the same uh, <laughs> webcam, but she just cannot can never calibrate the uh, the eye tracker. Um, and also, in a uh, test that I did on calibration levels, I found that there is a very strong correlation between the webcam sample rate and the calibration score. Um, so people um, sometimes cannot calibrate just because they have a, a poor webcam uh, or a poor internet connection. I'm not entirely sure where it is, but yeah, be prepared uh, to lose some participants, uh, so to speak. So I think it's uh, uh, it's also something that I'm going to do to redirect uh, participants to a non eye track experiment in case they uh, do not are not able to uh, calibrate. So I think that's sort of the the main thing that I've learned with. Uh, playing around with the eye tracker so far. Thank you, that's that's very helpful. I mean, I think, you know, I'm strangely, I haven't yet gotten myself to actually uh, running anything fully either because this has all just been, you know, taking up so much just the development of all of this. But I think the anticipation definitely is uh, you'll have to run lots of subjects, but hey, running subjects online is a lot easier. Um, and if you're able to tap into say university subject pools or something like that, it's not necessarily associated with a lot of um, cost 
Um, and, you know, I mean, you, you may have behavioral data from everyone and only can use eye tracking data from some fraction, but that's uh, certainly um, better than nothing. Yeah, definitely. I think you actually uh, raised quite an interesting point there, though, that if you, uh, because I'm planning uh, with my face world experiment to not really collect any behavioral data because it's just a sort of boring uh, <laughs> listen and look to at the task where you don't click on anything. Uh, and therefore, maybe it's a good idea to uh, sort of uh, design your experiment in such a way that it sort of involves uh, clicking or any other type uh, of um, doing, so to speak, on the participant's behalf. It may also help you evaluate some of the quality of the participants' behavior overall, <laughs> right? Not just quirky eye tracking data, it might be other quirkiness in their data too, some of them. Um, all right, we're coming up on the hour. We're happy to go a little bit over, but I'm mindful of people's time. Jeremy, did you want to say something quick about the um, just illustration of the results here or? Oh, uh, no, I just wanted to show that, well, you know, the graph you're seeing right now on my screen, I generated uh, from two test runs, I think, uh, with a former version of the same experiment. And I think, you know, the quality is not bad, but, um, Again, you know, th that was, uh, you know, the, I, the, those were two of my test runs. So I was able to calibrate my webcam and go through uh, the full experiment. So, um, that, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, the other thing I uh, wanted to say is that, as far as I can tell, the people um, who uh, developed this library and uh, I, uh, I should actually, we should, we should uh, say their name. I don't know, Florian, if you did, uh, yeah, well, it's part of the, uh, uh, it's in the slides, I think. Um, I think it's Alexandra Popolo, Popolos, um, I don't remember the name exactly. Uh, and her team, they actually are still working actively on, on the library, I think. So um, it could be, I don't know if Mika used, I don't remember which, you know, when, when what version uh, Mika used, but, uh, it could have improved a little bit. I know that my recent test runs were better than my uh, older ones. So, um. so there's a couple other questions that are coming up in the in the Q and A um, about the frequency and the um, you know quality and so on. And kind of like Mika just said already, um, it, you're at the mercy of your participants' equipment, really, right? You're using their webcam, so you're getting what what their webcam has to offer. Um, someone asked whether it's possible to print the user's webcam frequency into the results file. Um, any idea, Jeremy? Oh, you're on mute still. Sorry, there yes, I'm uh, yeah. having a hard time. Let, let me stop sharing. It will make things easier. Um, here, sorry. All right. Um, yeah, no, I, I, there's no built-in function for doing that in pen controller. And uh, actually, I don't know if there is uh, a way of easily retrieving that information from uh, the, the WebGazer API. Yep. Mika has her hand up. Sorry, I think I can answer nope. this question. Um, I actually did it quite easily post hoc in R because you simply have information on how many rates you get within each each second. Uh, so I just calculated the mean rate of uh, frames that I recorded each uh, full 1000 milliseconds. Um, so it's actually quite easy to do a post hoc. Oh, that's great. Yeah, good, good. You don't have to access the equipment. You just look at the data and that tells you what the observed frequency is. That's great to know. Um, excellent. Oh, and I see here helpful um, Jesse Storbeck, someone else who's been working um, with the eye tracker, uh, who says that uh, even when the calibration is seemingly bad, the data patterns are still pretty sensible but noisy. I think that's a very good other general point that you have to obviously deal with a lot of noise if you use this sort of platform to do that sort of thing. But as long as they, you know, a signal can still be detected from the noise, um, you may just need more data and, and there's trade-offs between all these sorts of things. Um, one other quick point um, I wanted to mention um, because I may have misspoken on that or it may have been not clear. So for the mouse tracking, which we didn't really get to, but again, there's a template on the farm as well. Um, you don't actually need a separate server to write the data to 
although you do have to be somewhat mindful that the results files that you collect um, get rather large because you're just collecting lots and lots of uh, data points on each individual trial as the mouse moves around. But that's something else that a lot of people were interested in. Um, we do have some documentation on that, and it's definitely um, there as a template uh, experiment. Um, ah, do we get a calibration score is another question um, right now, Jeremy. That gets something that's recorded on that front, right? Yeah. So um, remember what I showed you, the uh, 50, the number 50 in the parentheses of the calibrate command? That's that's the minimum threshold that needs to be met in order to continue to for calibration to be considered successful. Um, if I remember correctly, the results file will report the calibration score uh, for every calibrate um, command as well. Okay, we are just past three o'clock. Um, we are happy to take more questions, but um, as you've seen, we also have the forums. Um, we have the support at pcibix.net. Um, uh, email address. Um, the forums are great um, if you run into issues, especially as you get started. Also consider searching the forums first before posting because many things have been addressed there um, before, but um, Jeremy is uh, incredibly diligent and fast at replying to queries on the forum as well. Um, and so uh, if you run into new issues that aren't documented anywhere yet, um, please do feel free to post there and then others can benefit from insights as well. Uh, with more specific issues relative to particular problem, problems, again, the support PC IVEX, uh, support at pcivex.net email address is the place to turn to. A reminder, as you all start using the uh, new farm, as it's now available, share your demonstration links, and then uh, you will actually directly give us access to the code, and we can directly diagnose things and try things out and fix things and send a demonstration link back to you, et cetera. It's really streamlining collaboration a lot. You don't need to attach files or do anything um, of that sort. Um, so if there are no more questions, we're gonna wrap up here. Thank you all for coming. Um, we hope this was helpful. We will uh, share information about you know, all the Q and A stuff um, and the video recording about where we will post that um, on the, or where we make that available, we will uh, put that all up on the uh, announcement page and probably also link directly from the documentation so you can uh, uh, follow up on all of these things. Thanks all very much. And uh, we hope uh, this will be a valuable tool and many of you start using it. From now on, you're free to create your own accounts if you haven't yet on the farm and uh, we'll see you around. Thanks.